OK, now it flashes. OK, well, thanks very much to the organizers for the chance to talk here in this program. I've enjoyed my time talking to the nuclear folks as well as the electronic structure folks, and I've learned quite a lot. Now, it was a, a bit challenging for me to, uh, to prepare this talk um, because of several constraints. Some of you have seen me talk a lot of times. And, and uh, <laughs> my apologies to you. I try not to repeat things too much. Some of you also have heard me talk a lot of times and also heard Timo Lede talk um, two weeks ago. And so that was a double constraint. And then there's the other constraint that so there are some of you who are not nuclear physics uh, in nuclear physics, and therefore you've never heard me talk. And there, I need to r r do a lot of sort of introductory material. So I tried to balance all these uh, three aspects. So tell you about some work that our collaboration has done. So this is the nuclear lattice effective field theory collaboration, including Evgeny Eppelbaum and Herman Krebs from Bochum, and uh, Timo Lede, who gave the talk uh, a couple weeks ago, for, in, who's in Ulich, and Ulf Meissner, who's in Bonn in Ulich, and uh, Gautam Rupak, who's at Mississippi State. And I should mention before I forget that all the, the computations were done in, on the Blue Gene Q in Ulich. OK, so I'll start off by um, uh, reviewing what exactly is lattice effective field theory. Um, then I'll, so this will actually take up maybe half the, half the talk, because uh, uh, Francisco asked me to do a lot of sort of formalism and, and, and algorithm type stuff. And then I'll give some results on the carbon-12 spectrum on the Hoyle state, um, and show some ab initio lattice results up to A equals 28. This is something team already covered, but it's, since this is a, uh, sort of central to, to, to the algorithms, it's, it's good to cover it again. Then I'll talk to you about the oxygen-16 structure and spectrum, and properties of neutron matter, and some work we've done on scattering and reactions on the lattice. And then I'll summarize. So first of all, I'll start off by saying that I'm not doing lattice QCD, which, is, uh, si which are simulations done with, with quarks and gluons. On a, uh, so it's a relativistic simulation done with the lattice spacing on the order of 0.1 Fermi. But you will hear a talk by Amy that will come after uh, my talk that will be done in lattice QCD. Um, the, the technique I will be using, though, is, is treating the, the protons, and neutrons, protons and neutrons as point particles on a much coarser lattice, somewhere between 1 to 5 Fermi. So the 5 Fermi is, is not really relevant for, for nuclei, but, but if we want to do very dilute neutron matter, for example, we, we can take a rather coarse lattice spacing like that. So we're not resolving the, the internal structure of the neutron or the proton, but we're getting the low energy dynamics of these particles. Now, so lattice QCD uh, ha is able to carve out this part of this uh, strongly interacting matter phase diagram. So this is uh, the horizontal axis is the density of, nu of, of nucleons uh, per cubic femtometer. And the, the temperature is in units of mega electron volts. So lattice QCD can do all this nice physics of the early universe. Um, so essentially, you can go up to arbitrarily high temperatures. The problem is, if you go beyond a certain angle in chemical potential, or if you want to think of it in terms of density, um, you get a sign problem. And that's caused by the fact that you have these complex representations of SU3, the underlying gauge group. Um, actually, if, if you were attending David uh, Kaplan's uh, talk yesterday, he talked a little bit about the origin of this. Um, it's, it's related to the, the pi on degrees of freedom. Now, if you change the degrees of freedom you use for your simulation and work with protons and neutrons in a low energy effective theory, you can go to a, a higher density. And this is simply because uh, it's a different structure. The, the degrees of freedoms are, are, are different. And you actually have symmetries that help you out. And I'll explain a lot about that as we go along. Um, so you can sort of uh, get this, this kind of a convex region of the phase diagram. Um, using lattice effective field theory. There is a maximum temperature beyond which you should not go, because this is just an effective theory. There are, uh, you're integrating out certain degrees of freedom. And if you go to, too high in temperature, then the, then the thermal motion is, 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 has too much energy. Similarly, if you go to too high a density, then the Fermi momentum is too high, and you go beyond the limits of your effective theory. However, there is this nice region here where you can do lots of interesting things, like looking at the superfluid phase transition, perhaps a nuclear liquid transition if you do finite temperature simulations. I'll talk to you mostly today. Well, actually, all of my talk today is actually on ground state properties or excited states, not, not at finite temperature. But the formalism that I'm going to talk to you about will actually be very easily generalized to, to uh, finite temperature simulations. 
OK, so the, the, uh, the, te the, the formalism you use is, is effective field theory. So this is just field theory, not sort of a fundamental field theory with fundamental particles, but instead something uh, that tr tries, to tries to describe composite particles like protons and neutrons. Now, because the interactions are quite complicated, the basic idea of effective field theory is to do some sort of an expansion in powers of momenta. Now, in chiral effective field theory, you're also doing expansion powers of momenta as well as the mass of the pion. And the reason for that is the mass of the pion is, is a low energy scale that's lower than any other nuclear physics uh, degree of, of freedom scale. And so the, these are approximate Goldstone bosons associated with uh, chiral symmetry. So in, in chiral effective field theory, you have things like the exchange of, of a pion, this light degree of freedom. And this is what we would consider a leading order interaction. Now, we also have things like short range interactions. I've written just this as just the contact interactions. So in this way of power counting or, or counting up your, your effective field theory, these are the leading order interactions. And then you can, you can then do an expansion higher powers of momentum or powers of m pi. And you get things like 2 pi exchange. You get more complicated derivative contact interactions. And so the hierarchy kind of looks like this. At leading order, you have contact interactions and one pi exchange. Next to leading order, you have these more complicated two derivative contact interactions, as well as two pi exchange. And so that's, this is order q to the zeroth power, where q is the power of momentum, or the, or the mass of the pion. And this is order q squared. And then at n to a low, next to next leading order, you have order q to the third power. And then you have subleading two pi exchange terms, as well as the first instance of the three nucleon interaction here. Okay. So any questions up to this point? All right, so uh, lattice effective field theory takes this formalism and puts it onto a lattice. Now, there are a lot of things you have to work very hard to get on the lattice. One is how to do scattering on the lattice. So there is technology that has been developed by Lucier to, to take um, the, 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 the energies of a two-body system in a finite box. You change the size of the box. And by changing the size of the box, you measure the energy as a function of the, of the size. You actually can get the phase shifts from that information. Now, it turns out, because we are, we are writing down, uh, we're treating the protons and neutrons as fundamental <coughs> particles, for the two-body system, we can simply apply any boundary condition we want. Now, so I'll, I'll tell you one technique we use for just the two-body system to, to be able to get the phase shifts. And that's essentially taking the, the two nucleons. So nucleons is a generic term for proton or neutron. And we tie an infinitesimally light st uh, string between the two nucleons, such that the center of mass motion of the two particles is not affected. But the relative motion is constrained, such that you can't go beyond the length of the string. Okay, so in the center of mass frame as a function of the relative separation, we have a hard wall boundary condition. And so now we can look at the scattering states of the system. We just have spherical vessel functions beyond the range of the interaction. And so we can just measure the energy levels of the system as a function of, well, so we, we take a, a certain size sphere, spherical wall boundary given, given by the length of the thread or the string. And then we turn on the interactions, and we turn off the interactions, and we see a shift in the energy levels. And that can be interpreted as a phase shift. Okay. Now, one complication is that, well, a, a big complication is that on the lattice, we have broken rotational invariants. And so that we have things like the splitting of the spin 2 uh, representation. So here are your y2, 0, y2, 1s, y2, 2s, and such. Um, this gets split up into two cubic representations. But once you know um, how, how these things work out, you can, you can you can deal with this fact. So using this technology of the spherical wall method, um, you, can, you can measure phase shifts. Now, um, I'm going to talk to you a lot about algorithms. So I should mention, um, the way we do the calculation is we uh, construct what we call an improved leading order action. That is to say, we take those two contact interactions that I wrote down before and the one pi exchange. These are the leading order terms. Um, but we actually introduce a few more um, subleading terms to make the perturbative series converge faster. Okay? And so that the, the extra terms are actually effective range corrections. So these are momentum dependencies that we give to the contact interactions. And we do something actually a little bit more complicated that we have developed over the, the, a few years. And we do a little bit of smearing of the contact interactions to get the effective ranges correct. Um, but we only put them in the even partial ways. Right? I, I know this is a little bit complicated, especially if you're not in nuclear physics. So let me try to explain this. Okay, so we have spin degrees of freedom. And so I write these as polymatrices, uh, the sigma polymatrices. 
Um, and for the taus, those correspond with the isospin degrees of freedom, proton and neutron being your, 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 your multiple. Okay? And so um, we, when you do S wave scattering, uh, because of Fermi statistics, you can have spin equals to one, it's because it's a spin one half particle, total spin equal to one, and then the isospin has to be zero in order for you to have anti-symmetry. Or you can have spin equals to zero, and then have isospin equal to one. Okay? So the, there are two S-wave channels, and so what we do here is we actually do a little bit of smearing, putting some momentum dependence um, onto the two different channels, actually the same function here. Um, this is just the term you get from one pion exchange. That's just uh, a derivatively coupled boson. Okay. Right? Any questions about this so far? Can you uh, yeah, okay. magnitude of C1s0 and C3s1? Uh, it's a cutoff dependent quantity, so, so it's, it's, it's hard to say exactly. Uh, it, I can give you a number, but it wouldn't probably mean a lot to you. It would be something like uh, on the order of 10 to the minus fifth inverse MeV squared. <laughs> Yeah, so, so it doesn't mean anything to you. Yeah. So how does this function <laughs> f look like? For the function f, it's it's like a Gaussian function. It's a Gaussian. It's a Gaussian smear. So yeah. So so, so uh, yeah, I'll, I'll show you. I'll show you what it does, and it, you'll get more intuition for that. It, what it does is it prevents the S waves at leading order from doing this sort of saturating as you would get in the unitary limit, just flattening out. Okay. So what it does is it brings us back down, so you can kind of estimate the, the, the momentum scale which this occurs, and that, that's set by the, the range of the interaction. Okay? So at leading order, we have these triangles, and then at next leading order, I didn't show you those interactions, we have an, an, an extra nine um, <coughs> um, coefficients we have to, to fit. Now, the fact that we put this little extra smearing already at leading order makes the next leading order correction almost uh, very, actually quite weak. You don't have to do a whole lot. So the, the principle we use for our calculations is, okay, th there's a very we have a very complicated system with essentially an infinite set of interactions we have to introduce at some, uh, eventually, okay? And so I like to make the analogy that our calculations is like playing golf, it's like, like hitting a, a par three in golf. So what you want to do is you have this big supercomputer, you get a few million CPU hours, mm -hmm. core hours, and you try to strike the, the ball as close as you can to the, the flagpole, okay? A and so that's like the non-perturbative simulation, the sampling of the path integral, and that's what we're gonna do. And then what you wanna do is hopefully the ball's close enough to the flagpole that you can then do a chip and then do a putt, okay? So that's the perturbation theory, and that's kind of the way we do our calculations. So we try to get as close to the answer as possible so that the perturbation theory actually has a shot of converging. Can you explain again this yeah. function f, I mean, because you yeah. Take this interaction from EFT, but then yeah. Change it. yeah, yeah. So, 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 so it's important that the function is analytic everywhere. So that's why we take something like a Gaussian. So the idea is we're just resumming some of the terms because we have to introduce all these. There are all these other terms that have these q squared dependencies with a, with a delta function interaction. So the idea is we're just shuffling them into the, the, the leading term already. So, so there's a q to the four term. There's a q to the six term. We grab some of these guys and we add them together, and we put this in and have it, it as an analytic function, okay? Yeah, 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 you, you just adjust it such that you, you get as close as possible. Now, now the point is you should, yeah. There, there's, many, there's many ways to do this. In fact, what you should do then is go back and see that if you do different ways, you get different answers. And so this is actually a nice check. So, 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 so when you do a simulation of something observable, you can then not only change the lattice spacing, but you can also change how you, you resum these terms. <coughs> and so you should hopefully, if, if things converge, then, then they also should converge to the same answer. Yeah. Uh, 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 How big is your yeah. Okay, that's a good question. So if you if you did naive uh, uh, effective field theory with just pure d delta function contact interactions with one pi exchange, you would be able to do up to a equals three very well with the coarse lattice spacing. If you shrink if you shrink the lattice spacing, you can do up to a equals six. Okay. So this is uh, smaller. So if uh, so if you go down to something like on the order of one Fermi for the lattice spacing 1.5, 1.4 Fermi, something like that, then, then the alpha particle starts to look okay. But with something bigger than that, then, then, then you, you have to take into account the effective range. The range of the alpha particle is about 1.4. Yeah, it, no, it's 1.5 Fermi. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Sure. So, so how do you know that it looks okay? The binding energy is right. The RMS radius is correct, and, and things but like that. But that's the only thing you can measure. Well, you can also measure. Uh, you can measure lots of things. That there, there are lots of things. So like, like the, the for example, if you can measure the finite volume uh, dependence. Oh, yeah. And, uh, also, yeah. Yeah. So velocity spacing between one and five Kelvin. How can you get the one point five? Yeah, yeah. We'll explain that in a sec. Yeah. So, so, so the point is, right? You can put as many as four particles on a single lattice point. So, so you think of this as a box. So each lattice spacing is like a cube, of with the side 1.9. Okay. So I'll show you results with 1.97 Fermi. Okay. So you can put up to four particles in, in one such box. So if you think of just these as little cubes making your nuclei, you can actually with this with this lattice spacing make, go up to three times the density of iron nucleus that way. Now, you don't want to obviously completely fill your lattice, but the point is, is it's a little bit misleading to think that if you have a 1.97 Fermi, that the, nuclei, the, the nucleons are really separated by that. The point is that, that you can have multiple nuclei. You say you put alpha particle in a 1.9 Yeah, yeah. <coughs> but that's bigger than the alpha particle. No, no, yeah, yeah. The, yeah. When you do the calculation, when you, right. yeah. So, so another way to think about it is to think about it in momentum space. OK, a 1.97 Fermi uh, lattice spacing corresponds with the momentum space pi over A, the lattice spacing. And that's about 314 MeV. Especially you have no resolution beyond the uh, Yeah. Yeah. So, 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 so if you do measure the RMS radius of the alpha particle with the 1.97 Fermi, you get 1.5 Fermi for the RMS radius. You do actually get. And for the triton, you get 1.8 Fermi, which is also correct. The size of the box doesn't matter because it's, it's, a, it's a bound state. And once you get beyond, I yeah. I'm curious to see whether you've tried that. Yeah, we have. Yeah, yeah that, that's, 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 that's easy. Right. Yeah, that's pretty easy. So yeah. So we've gone up to 16 Fermi boxes. Yeah. OK. So that's your lower limit on this scattering? The lower limit? You on have, well, you have these PCMs, right? Oh, these are mom these are um, oh, sorry momentum in the center mass frame the relative momentum. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm am so, sorry I didn't yeah, I got distracted by the questions I didn't really explain so the. Just, just to get some sense, so if I did just the effective field theory the way we mm -hmm. think it should work, it should yeah. be used. Yeah. And then if I try to do your a equals let's say twenty eight. Yeah. Nuclei. How big will be your sort of error bars? I, I want to get a sense of. Uh, you just want to do with with delta functions. Yeah, just the, just the naive. Okay, okay. So, so what you can I'm just do. Yeah. To get a sense of how much you're, how much you're, that's how, how much we helping yeah. yeah yeah it's a lot so you will not get anywhere close to a equals 28 <coughs> if you don't have smearing is the simply okay so if you so in that I, sense the yeah. effective field theory has been modified in a way to get the a equals 28 yeah, yeah. so it depends on how you, how you do your effective theory so so there's some people who who will do everything non perturbatively in other words, you have a leading order calculation that's non-perturbatively evaluated. Then you have a next leading order term that's non-perturbatively evaluated. And then you have a next next leading order term that's also non-perturbatively evaluated. So if you keep doing it that way, then eventually you get into a safe zone where you get results that are fine. But it's just, it, if, we, if you want to do a method where you really have a perturbative expansion, which you kind of would like the effective theory to have, then, then you have to, to, to take the step where some of the non-perturbative physics is incorporated. Of the effective range, yeah. Okay. So, what's yeah. your momentum cutoff you said for this lattice? So, so, so <coughs> the results I'll show you is 314 MeV. So yeah. it's. Okay, but, <coughs> but here you're talking about the phase shift. There are the 100 MeV. They're already affected by this Gaussian correction, right? So I'm sorry. I mean, if you look at your phase shift, yeah. if you don't do the Gaussian correction, say. Yeah. It, 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 already it, 100 MeV. Or yeah. So, so if you, if you have. If you your momentum cutoff, so why? why? What? Yeah. Oh, okay. So, 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 yeah. Uh, this, this, this smearing is not a cutoff. Okay. It, it's, it's not related to the cutoff at all. It's just a resummation of terms that I call leading order. It's just as if I were to say, okay, here's my next leading order term. I'm going to promote it and call it leading order. It's not really a cutoff at all. Okay. Yeah, but then it's become empirical. It's no longer. No, it, it's so not. It's being yeah, 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 yeah. This, 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 as, 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 as,
with this no, no, four factors, you think it's that. that. You see, so you can say that it has correct, you see, those two. Yeah. yeah. So, 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 so up to that point, you see, if it doesn't have, you see, the next term is the expansion correct. Mm -hmm. so, so I don't think you see the tracing should be so harsh. Yeah, so, so, so the way you check that it's, it's systematic is that you do this with different, different resummations, OK? So, so here's, here's the way I, I view effective field. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I'll, yeah, I'll, here, here. Uh, let me, let me, yeah, this will also take, take a little bit of time. Oh, yeah, yeah, we can do, yeah, I, I have a little lecture on effective field theory we can do in, in the discussion session. A long lecture for me. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so those are the P-way facias. All right, then we also have three nuclear forces, which comes at n to a low. And so there are, so these terms, these are the two pion exchange terms. So, so the, the solid lines are the nucleons, and the dotted lines are the pions. So this is what we call two pion exchange. And these interactions are set by pion nucleon scattering already, so these are already known. But there are cutoff or lattice spacing dependent art operators we also need to fix. And that we get from the binding energy of the triton, and that's what I've shown you here. So you take a, a, a certain size cubic box, and then you measure the binding energy as a f uh, the, the energy as a function of the size of the box. And this, this function, we actually, at least for the two-body case, we actually know the analytic form of this. And numerically, we find that the, the three-body case also fits the same form. This is just a Yukawa function. Uh, and so, so what we do is we fit one of these parameters to the binding energy of the triton. The other one you can actually get by make, making the connection between the pion interaction, which is a Goldstone boson associated with the, the chiral symmetry I mentioned. And that's actually related to the, the, the matrix element of the SU2 <coughs> axial current with the weak interactions, which gives you the decay of the triton. And so that actually lets you set both of the, um, the other term. Are, are you actually doing the beta decay of the triton, or are you yeah. So, so what we do is we, we look at the RG flow as we go down to our cutoff. And then so what we can get is we can actually pin down CD from this D hat R. D, the, it basically, the, the, way, the way Peter did, did it, Peter Navratil, it's the same sort of calculation. OK, so then we also have to take into account um, things like pi mass differences between pi 0 and pi plus, pi minus. And we have Coulomb interactions between the it's, it's not, not much. It's just five, five MeV out of 100. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, and the proton-proton Coulomb repulsion, and then also a small charge symmetry breaking as well as charge independence breaking coming from these contact interactions at next to leading order. Um, and then you can uh, measure the difference between the binding energy of helium-3 and, and the triton, which I already mentioned, that's just hydrogen-3. Um, now, this funny curve is coming from the fact that you subtract two Yukawa functions with slightly different exponential behaviors, and when you subtract it, you get this, this little wiggle. Yeah? So is your simulation done in a periodic box? Yes, periodic box. How do you treat the Coulomb that is long range? Yeah, so we do bound states. <laughs> we do bound states where the Coulomb <coughs> can be treated perturbatively, because, it's cut, the, because the long range is cut off by the wave function. Oh, so you don't put that in the propagator? We, we don't put that in the propagator, no. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. How much is the Coulomb interaction? In, in, in this, oops, oops sorry. Um, this, uh, this was a while ago, but I believe it was only on the order of uh, half an MeV or something. Some of the, yeah. Yeah, 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 that's right. That's right. Yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah, it, I'm sorry, I, I was not even. I didn't even get to this. <laughs> I got distracted. Okay, and, and then the difference was is uh, 0.76 MeV, which uh, sorry, uh, we get a, an, an answer of 0.79 MeV uh, with an error bar of 0.05 from the extrapolation, and it's reasonable compared with the experimental value. Okay, so now we get to. Okay, I'm way behind, but it's okay. Um, so now we get to the actual Monte Carlo part. So we do Euclidean time projection. We start off with initial state if we're doing sort of ground state, excited state calculations. And then we have some final state. Okay? So suppose we want to simulate the alpha particle. Then we can think of these particles as diffusing in space as a function of Euclidean time. This is all, a lot of you do this. Um, so we have things like the contact interactions, one point exchange. However, we're going to use the auxiliary field transformation. So you've seen this before. Just do hubbard sadonovich transformation. OK, so then instead of having the nucleons interacting with themselves, they're interacting with the background field. 
Now, so uh, we actually will introduce 16 auxiliary fields. So one coupled to the total density, one coupled to the spin density, one coupled to the, the isospin density, one coupled to the spin isospin density. And then actually also in this, in this formalism, the pions look like an auxiliary field, although they do have uh, non-local correlations um, in space, but they're not dynamical because there's not no non-local correlations in time. Why not? Uh, because we're not using, we're, not, we're below the pion production threshold. So we simply only have a virtual exchange of pions. That's in your effective field. Yeah, 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 that's the region we're targeting. How yeah. do you say the three body forces? The three body forces, so this is uh, N2LO, so it's perturbatively done. It's a perturbative. We, we, actually, actually, the way it's calculated is with an auxiliary field, but with, with uh, numerical derivatives. So that there are, are small, so, so basically, okay, this is sort of an expert question. Um, so so we, we introduce some auxiliary fields. Okay? But we kill the, the induced four-body interactions that those auxiliary fields would produce by simply taking numerical derivatives of the small parameter. So that's, that's how you deal with it. Okay. So you mentioned that with the pion, there will be a sign problem. So yes. Yeah. How do you treat with that? So, yeah, yeah we'll, we'll, we'll get to, yeah, uh, this is all about to come. Okay? So I should mention that um, it turns out that there is an approximate symmetry of low energy <coughs> nuclear physics that actually Helps, helps us out. In fact, this, the symmetry is, is how I got involved in these simulations to begin with. The fact that there's an approximate SU4 symmetry. So you have the proton up, the proton down, the neutron up, and the neutron down. And the fact that in both S-wave channels, the scattering length, well, it's, it's, it's a, first of all, it's attractive. And in both cases, the scattering length is quite large. Okay, so they are somewhat equal, not, not exactly, but, but they're somewhat, somewhat equal in strength. And so you have an approximate SU4 symmetry that's called Wigner's SU4 symmetry. Now, in that limit where you have attractive SU4 interactions, it turns out that you can do simulations without any sign problems. Yeah, and that's a actually how we're able to do this. The fact that we have all these couplings, but there is an approximate SU4 symmetry underlying this physics. And I'll. So if the symmetry is exact, then there would be no sign problem. If the yeah. symmetry is bulk, right? So yeah, yeah. So there wouldn't be eventually sign there, problem. There's a sign problem, and we deal with it. I, I'll, sh I'll show you how we deal with it. We spend all our time dealing with the sign problem, like, like you do. <laughs> okay, so we have the auxiliary field for the single nucleons. Okay, so we have this matrix of amplitudes between the initial state J to, to final state I. It's a function of these auxiliary fields as well as the pion field. So if we want to get the full amplitude, you take the determinant of this matrix. And what's nice about the projection Monte Carlo technique is that if I have a nucleus that has A nucleons, let's say I do carbon 12, A equals 12, then, then I construct a 12 by 12 matrix. And I just need to calculate the determinant of this 12 by 12 matrix over and over again with different auxiliary fields. Okay, that's essentially the, the, the thing we need to calculate. Now, before I get there, I want to give you a sense of how um, this CSU4 symmetry kicks in. And since uh, a lot of you guys are Monte Carlo people, uh, I think this is kind of cool. So I'll talk to you a little bit about spectral convexity. So you can prove rigorously, and so this argument's here in, in, in a PRL in 2007. Um, if you have any fermionic theory with an SU2N symmetry, and you only have two-body interactions, and the two-body potential has, is negative semi-definite in its Fourier transform, um, then you can prove that you have these convexity bounds for the spectrum of the system. So let me try to explain. So here is the energy of the ground state of the system. So if you have a weakly attractive potential, then you can consider you, your, your system in a trap or some sort of a box. It doesn't matter what the confining system is. Okay? But if it's a strongly uh, bound, uh, attractive system, it's self-bound, and so the energies are negative. But in either case, the point is if you have this 2n, where n is an integer, and then you pr put the ground state energy for, for as a function of a, the number of particles, and so here is a multiple of 2n, which I call 2n times k. And then here's 2n times k plus 1, the next multiple of 2n. And here's the next multiple. And you just draw, put all these points down. And if you draw any lines between any even a uh, points, then all the, the points above, uh, then all the other points between those lines must lie on the line or above it. OK, that can be proved rigorously. Um, same thing in this case here. And the way you prove it is actually by showing that you can simulate the system. That's kind of, I, I find that kind of cute. Okay? And the way you simulate the system so is, is as follows. So there are two n species of fermions. And so we're going to calculate the path integral using projection Monte Carlo with just one auxiliary field. 
Uh, that's because the SU2N symmetry allows you to do with just one auxiliary field. And that auxiliary field is coupled to the, po the total particle density. So I can write this as a path integral of just a single auxiliary field, the action here for the auxiliary field, with a determinant g. Okay? Uh, and now this action is just coupled the way you, you do the coupling. So phi is coupled to the total density n dagger n. Okay? And all you need to do is to get the, the, the potential is simply have the inverse, prop, the inverse potential here in the kernel of the quadratic, firm, uh, quadratic form. Okay, and then when you integrate over phi, you, you get the interactions. Now, how do you prove this theorem? Well, now you consider this, uh, the case where you have k plus 1 particles of, uh, for j species. So we have two n species of particles. Okay? Suppose you have k plus 1 particles for the first j. And then you have k particles for the next 2n minus j. All right? So here's a pictorial representation. So you have k plus 1 for the first j. And then you have just k for the rest of them. So the initial state you construct for your projecting, projector Monte Carlo is you put, let's take the case where you have three particles and two particles. You put three orbitals um, down for your species 1. You put the, the same three orbitals down for your species 2. And all the way up to species j, you put three. Then you put down two orbitals, then same two orbitals here, same two orbitals there. Okay? Now, the fact that the auxiliary field couples only to the total density means that it has a block diagonal structure. Now, remember when we do the simulation of a, a, uh, a body system, it's an A by A matrix. And the A by A matrix looks something like this, where you have uh, J copies of a K plus 1, K plus 1 matrix, which are all the same. And then you have uh, 2n minus uh, j, j copies of a, a k by k matrix. So this determinant is just the product of the determinants of the blocks. And so you can write down the amplitude for this system. Uh, don't worry about this notation. I'm just labeling the thing. So you have j copies of the k plus, k, k plus 1 by k plus 1 matrix determinant. And then you have 2n minus j copies of the determinant for the k by k matrix. And now what you can do is you can use a holder inequality, which states that for any positive P and Q satisfying, satisfy, satisfying that the reciprocal of P plus the reciprocal of Q equals 1, then you can bound the inner product of F and G, these functions, by the P norm of F times the Q, the, the Q norm of G. And if you apply this to this system, you're essentially just bounding these, these guys, the absolute value of this integral, by things where you have single determinants of this type or single determinants of that type. And then when you just take the logarithm of the amplitude, you get then an, a, a bound for the slope of, of the amplitude as a function of time. And that it's, fair, it's fair to say that essentially, I mean, you, this is a property of the factorization. Of the it's, it's exactly. It's, it's a property of the factorization. Yeah. So what's nice is it's completely general. And then from that, you get these convexity bounds quite straightforwardly like that from the polar inequality. OK. Any questions about that? So, so this is my counter argument to people saying that when you do numerical physics, you're not really doing real theory. But you can actually prove things by doing a numerical um, simulation of, of a system. OK. OK, so then you can check whether or not the SE4 bounds are satisfied in, in actual nuclear physics. Now, first of all, I should mention SE4 is not an exact symmetry of nuclear physics at all. There's a Coulomb interaction which breaks everything. Even the 1 pi exchange breaks it. So lots of things break it. However, if you draw these convexity bounds up to oxygen 16, they're all satisfied. So that suggests, at least phenomenologically, there is some underlying approximate SE4 symmetry that can kick in, that can help you in these simulations. And that's actually what we use to, to, to do our simulations. So here's the schematic of how the, the calculations are done. So each one of these little blocks are a little transfer matrix, an <coughs> exponential minus h delta t. Actually, if you want to be technical about it, we actually do normal ordering of exponential minus h delta t. So that actually makes an exact transformation between <coughs> the, the, the Grassman variable language, which Shailesh talked about, to the operator um, formalism. So if you want to do that without any sort of extra errors of order delta t, and you want to make an exact transformation between Grassman variables to operators, then you need this normal normal ordering of the exponential. Um, so what we do is we start off with some initial state psi. And just let, make a simple calculation. We're trying to get, let's say, the ground state. Then we put psi on the other side. Okay, Suppose psi is some state with A nucleons. Then first of all, we propagate it with some approximate form of the transfer matrix. So what we do is we take an exactly SE4 symmetric Hamiltonian and get this, the transfer matrix for that guy. So the reason we do that is so that we can get close to the ground state of the system very cheaply because there's no sign problem. And we can do it with one auxiliary field. And so this part of the simulation just flies very, very rapidly. So this is just this n dagger n piece? 
Uh, this is just, yeah, yeah, basically an SE4 invariant action, so something coupled to total density. And so the idea is by the time we propagate to here, we're already very close to the, the actual system we want. Okay, so this is a size extensive, size consistent, both, okay, so bo both uh, uh, <laughs> way of doing this approximation. Okay, um, and then we can then propagate with a full transfer matrix at leading order, like that, we propagate, and then we do the same thing backwards propagating that way. Okay, we can do this because we're using auxiliary fields and not doing any diffusion. We don't have any walkers going through, so we can do forwards and backwards propagation and they meet in anywhere in the middle. But, uh, but, but yeah, yeah, so, sorry. Yeah. That in memory you have every one of those. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's all memory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Now, now, now the thing is, the reason why that's not a big hit is because we, we still have to struggle with the sign problem anyways. So if we had a very long chain to begin with, yeah, yeah. Was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. good. So, so if I understand right, even with the presence of the, so there, there was just one auxiliary field, but yeah. here, here, there's my, 16 auxiliary fields. Yeah, field. plus so the pions. Even, uh, even without, even there, there's no real sign problem. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, so the the point is, if we have, um, I yeah, I even there, because there's an approximate SE4 symmetry, there's a little sign problem. Okay. So, so, so here's the strategy. In this part, there's no sign problem at all. Okay. And in this part, there is a little bit of sign problem. Eventually, you'll die by the sign problem. The sign problem kills everybody eventually. Okay. But, but the thing is, we we live long enough that we can extract out energies relatively well. Right. Yeah. Oh. Um, what particle numbers you can extend this approximate treatment? Because the yeah. issue for forces, they are not going to be the separation. Yeah. yeah. And therefore, there will be an upper limit in the particle number you can do. So, so what you're saying? So, so you're saying because as you go to higher and higher a, this will get a poor, poor approximation, and you have to work hard in this part. Yeah. Yeah, it, that is true. Um, for alpha nuclei, though, I, I'll show you the results. We go up to A equals 28. We're able to get reasonable results up to 28. It, actually, you were at Timo's talk, so you, you probably saw that already. Yeah. Um, yeah. Actually, he showed very little about the, the, okay. the yeah. numbers. Okay, I, I'll show them. It wasn't very clear. But in principle, we can say that we can do calcium 40 using this way, <laughs> which I probably doubt they do. Well, well, calcium 40 is beyond our, our, our scope right now. What is the limit? 28 is our limit right now. Why? Uh, because uh, we tried it, and that's how far we could go. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so, so now um, so if we want to calculate, uh, so obviously we can extract out the, the energies by taking uh, logarithmic derivatives and numerical the logarithmic derivatives of this amplitude. <coughs> so I should mention that the way we sample these, uh, we update these, these auxiliary fields is by hybrid Monte Carlo. Now, I, I, yeah, I made a decision not to cover that because I thought it would take too long, and I think it was a good decision. So that's the non-local updating scheme, where basically you use molecular dynamics to propose a trajectory in the space, and then use a metropolis except reject condition to, 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 to do the detail bounds correctly. Okay, so if we wanted to calculate an operator expectation value, we just stick it in the middle here. And so when we forward propagate to that state, we get the ground state, for example. Or if we backwards propagate to that state, we get the ground state as well. And then if we want to do next to leading order, next to next to leading order corrections, so these are order q squared or q to the third power, then we just insert these, you know, perturbation theory, either one insertion for first order perturbation theory, or what would be much harder is the second order perturbation theory where you did double insertion. So all of this is well. Is, is well understood. The numerical speed of doing these calculations beyond first order perturbation is, there, is quite hard. That simply by putting in the orange. Putting in the orange. Yeah, yeah. For, for energies, we can do that, absolutely. For, for, for perturbation theory, first order perturbation theory, for energies, we just simply put in the middle. That's easier. So yeah, Th that's what you're asking, right? Yes, that's what I'm asking, but then you don't have to put it in between. Yeah, yeah. No, no. I was just showing you the general case. If for, for the case where you're just doing perturbations on the operator, you just use the usual yeah. expectation value. Any other observable yeah, to yeah, to yeah. To that's right, that's right. OK, now what's nice about this lattice effective field theory is that it actually operates in a manner that's sort of orthogonal to, to all the other, um, well, I shouldn't say all the other methods, but a lot of the other ab initio methods in that we don't really touch the wave functions. We don't put constraints on wave functions. We don't you know, do fixed node. We don't do um, harmonic oscillator basis expansion. We do, don't do anything. So the particles kind of just do whatever they want to do. So we automatically get things like clustering where we have four particles, three particles, two plus two, things like that. And so 
Um, knowing, knowing that fact, we sort of directly went towards systems where we, did ha where we thought there would be clustering and where the other methods would have more difficulty um, seeing these things. And so we took a look at carbon-12 spectrum and, and, and the Hoyle state. So uh, I should mention Timo Leidig uh, gave a nice talk a couple weeks ago describing this. Um, he, he talked a little bit about um, the quark mass dependence, the, the whole question of if, if the, the universe, the fundamental parameters of nature were slightly different, for example, if the light quark masses were just a few percent different, whether or not we would have carbon in our universe and therefore whether we'd have life. Um, so that was a very nice question. I'm not going to cover that, but I will talk to you a little bit about the Hoyle state that plays a central role in that. So, Sorry, yeah. So yeah, I, I'll, I'll tell you, it's coming in a second. Okay, so the alpha particle is just the, the, the nucleus of helium-4. Carbon-12 is, is you know, your carbon-12. Um, now, it's actually quite difficult for a star to produce carbon-12. Now, the reason for that, well, it, it might not be obvious why. So um, the way to think about it is, uh, if you look at the, the alpha particle or the, the, the helium-4 nucleus, the binding energy per nucleon is about 7.1 MeV. Now, if you look at the binding energy per nucleon for carbon-12, it's on the order of 7.5 or something like that. So it's an exothermic reaction. You can take three alpha particles, put them together, and get a carbon-12. The problem is, is getting it from 4 to 12 uh, requires going over a barrier, because all the others, A equals 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, they all have less than 7.1. And so how does nature get from here to there? Well, it does it by sort of two miracles. The first miracle is there is a, uh, the ground state of brilliant 8, which is actually an unstable resonance, actually lies very close to the threshold, which enhances this reaction of the two alphas coming together. And it just holds them long enough that another alpha comes together. Um, however, that's actually not enough to, to make this uh, reaction go. Um, Fred Hoyle back in the 1950s took a look at how much enhancement you get just from brillium aid and it turns out to be off by several orders of magnitude that would not be enough to get the observed carbon in our universe. And so he made this bold prediction that there was another resonance. There was this time a resonance of carbon-12 that actually enhanced this reaction that made the production of carbon-12 possible. Okay? And so, yeah. Unstable. Uh, yeah, I'd say. Yeah. So the Hoyle state is the name for this resonance? It's the na name for this resonance, yeah. Okay. It should be called the Holy State. The Holy State. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, carbon 12. Okay, so how am I doing on time? Okay, I just need to go very fast. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, all right. Um, OK, so, so here is the projection time. And here are two different initial states um, for the ground state of carbon-12. We start off with two initial states. The idea is that they both will plateau to the same value. So this is just calculating the energy for an intermediate time. And the idea is, as you go to large times, this will just approach some plateau value. Uh, and then with two different initial states, you would be able to triangulate this better. In fact, Timo uh, has data that shows we've done this with many, many states now, and that actually helps the signal a lot. Um, so you can do then calculate the, just the corrections you get at this is NLO, next leading order, isospin symmetric terms, as well as isospin breaking, electromagnetic corrections, and the N2LO corrections, which includes the three nucleon forces. Now, the place where I'll try to make up some time is not by not spending too much time on these graphs and just showing numbers, OK? So if at leading order, including some of the interactions promoted from NLO, we get 96 MeV. Now, I should mention, if we did not play this game of putting the, 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 the extra terms in, this number would be somewhere on the order of 130, 140 MeV overbound. That's, that's the direction things go. But by putting those terms in, we're essentially robbing the NLO corrections of its strength and putting it up here. Okay, so now as a result, the things um, don't oscillate very much, but if you were to just look at how these numbers bounce around, you'd be kind of upset that it seems like this goes, you know, goes up, then it goes down, and it doesn't really level out, level out. But if you actually did a straight calculation at leading order 130, and then you ended up at 77 here, you would see that it's actually converging better than, than what so was suggested. Here. So even yeah. at next to leading order, you're, you're keeping some the, the same terms you had at, at leading yeah, order? Yeah, so, so oh, okay, so it's not, uh, yeah. So yeah, so, so, so we don't put all the next leading order terms in. We just put in the effective range terms and such, yeah. 
Okay. Um, so now the fact that we're sitting right on top of the experimental value, that's just complete luck. There's still some systematic errors, obviously maybe on the order of four or five MeV that comes about from the fact that, you know, lattice spacing artifacts and next next and next leading order corrections and such mm -hmm. like that. Okay. If you didn't fit this Gaussian thing, yeah. if you started point thirteen, what would happen in the next order? It, you would have just a, you it, it jump way way up again. So it'd be a big sort of series like that. Yeah, yeah, it's really is 56. 56 okay. Yeah, yeah. Those slides I had to cut because I thought it'd be running out of time, but yeah, okay. Okay, so the simulations, okay, so we can do simulations with, with general sort of initial states. The things I showed you in the beginning, uh, sorry, just the last slide here, these, were, these calculations were done with Fermi sort of Slater determinants of plane waves in a box, okay? But we can work with arbitrary initial states, an arbitrary function, um, you take a Slater determinant, some anti-symmetric product of those guys, and then you just simply translate these over all possible locations on the lattice to give them good momentum. And then we can do things like working with shell model wave functions. This is what I really like about this method is we can test which wave functions actually give us the answer quicker, uh, the quickest. Um, that gives us some information about the underlying structure. So we can use shell model wave functions. By that I just mean your associated Hermite functions that are, are eigenstates of the harmonic oscillator. That's what are used in shell model calculations. Or we can use more sort of alpha cluster wave functions. And so maybe this connects with what, what uh, Kevin was talking about. So we can start off with initial states where we have Gaussians of, of particles, clusters of alphas centered at different locations. So we have a cluster here, a cluster there, a cluster there. And see that converges to the, to the state that we are looking for more quickly. So uh, if we look, for example, at, yeah. So many of would have thought because you're in the auxiliary field framework that yeah. all your initial wave functions would have to look like some of the single particle wave functions. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a sum of single particle wave functions. That's correct. So if I wrote down something that wasn't that, it would no. be in trouble. Yeah, yeah. But, but we, we take advantage of, uh, of Yeah, exactly. OK. All right. So, um, so shell model wave functions by themselves, what we, fee what we see in these carbon-12 and oxygen-16 simulations is they don't have enough four nuclear correlations built in. Um, they do eventually develop them as we project in time. We, we cool the system down, and they, they start to form these alpha clusters. But it turns out we can reproduce the same results more quickly directly from alpha cluster wave functions. So I'll show you th these results in, in a second. So I call these delta and lambda for obscure reasons. I'll, I'll explain it in a second. So here's the same data you saw before, the two initial states, the red uh, lines you've already seen. Here's another initial state that actually gives you the same sort of behavior, plateaus the same uh, guy. Now, then we actually have three other initial states that seem not to want to go to the ground state right away. Now, eventually, these guys have s the quantum numbers of a zero plus state, the same as the ground state. So they will actually eventually drop down and, and hit the ground state. But they seem to have a, a different structure, not enough overlap with the ground state that they seem to have a little plateau. Now, the, the way we actually really know that they're different initial states is that we can start off with uh, two different initial states construct a two by two matrix of amplitudes and see that we actually have two different orthogonal states here, that we have two propagating states, okay? And so this is um, another alpha cluster state that I call lambda. And so the underlying structures of these guys for the ground state, what I call the deltas, are actually tr equilateral triangle configurations of alpha particles. So this seems to be the structure of the ground state as well as the first two plus state. And then for the other configuration, that gives you the, the second zero plus state as well as the second two plus state seems to be something that's more elongated in our, in our lattice simulations. We find it uh, with the, the, the large overlap with some sort of bent arm configuration like this. So um, here are the results. Um, so for this first two plus state, we get 89 at next to leading order. Compare that with experimental values. Um, for, the, for the Hoyle state, we get 85. And that's actually a bit lucky, maybe, in terms of agreement. And for the second two-plus state, that's actually something <laughs> under active investigation as to the structure of the state as well as its, um, uh, its, its binding energy. So um, that's the <coughs> results for carbon-12. Now, here is uh, the question of how far we can go. Let's see how my, I'm catching up a little bit. Yeah. I'm catching up. <laughs> OK. 
OK, so um, I should mention, you see also the talk by Timo Lady on June 25th. He covered some of this. So the, the question is, what are the current computational limits, as well as the systematic errors and how to improve it? So I've shown you results for, well, OK, I didn't really show you because I deleted the slides, but, but Bob asked about it. So, so for, for helium-4, we get about 28. Um, for billion-8, we get about 56. And carbon-12, we get 92. And the question is, what happens if we just go straightforwardly with our action and calculate? Can we actually go further? And so we can, we can go up to oxygen-16, uh, neon-20, magnesium-24, and silicon-28. So the method actually scales up, and, and we can do these simulations um, on a supercomputer. The scaling is quite good. The sign problem actually does not kill us um, yet. We can probably go up to 32, sulfur-32. Um, but there is a systematic overbinding uh, if we just do the calculations as with the interactions we have what so far. What happens if you go away from multiples of four? Yeah, if we go away from multiples of four, if we're just one nucleon or two nucleons away, it's not a big deal at all. Okay. Yeah, because it's just a small correction to the, the symmetry so of the larger. You can do all the yeah. yeah, 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 we can, we can do quite a bit. Now, now, but we did want to understand, <coughs> we did want to try to understand um, how how the systematic overbinding occurs. And so we looked at the underlying structures of these states and what was going on. And we realized what was going on is there's actually a crossover transition that's happening here for these alpha nuclei. We have these, in, for the lighter alpha nuclei, like carbon-12, like beryllium-8, we have these alpha clusters that are pretty well defined. But as we get to, to larger and larger alpha nuclei, <coughs> it seems to be the crossover transition where they sort of melt into each other and get a bit more compact. Okay, they, they, they actually physically contract, and then they touch more tightly together. Now, what we're finding is when we get up to oxygen 16, we're having um, four of these alpha clusters kissing each other mutually on the lattice, and that actually seems to be causing the overbinding, and that actually just simply propagates throughout all our calculations. So now, we only do our calculations up to next to leading order, so if we had higher order uh, interactions, that, this would eventually be corrected. Now, the problem is, is that some of those operators are quite a bit higher in order than we, we were able to do right now. So one way to try to fix this problem is simply to say, OK, there are irrelevant operators that are kicking in here because we're trying to push our, our, our last calculation as high as we can. It's like taking a little car you, know, you bought with when you were a graduate student and then trying to drive to, to Boston from <coughs> Seattle. Okay? So we're trying to go as far as we can. And the question is, how do we fix up our car to get there? And so what we found is, Okay. Now, yeah. Can we translate this into the fact that essentially, if your cutoff is not high enough, that's you, you, you do not resolve that's the shell structure of the nucleus? That, that's, that's related to that, yeah. yeah. We, we see it systematically in terms of the four clusters just yes. touching. Yeah. yeah, but that's another way to interpret it. Um, so, so what we simply did was we included a, a, a higher interaction, so actually four nuclear interaction that's a little bit smeared, that would actually take into account the fact that the four clusters were, were touching and, and overbinding that way. So if we do that, and we just put in a smeared four in interaction, and just, just with one parameter, just fit it, we actually are able to, to crack this problem. Yeah, so there's a smeared uh, four nuclear interaction that's able to actually touch all four alpha clusters when they're kissing. That's, that's repulsive. It's repulsive. Now, this is, this is outside of the standard effective field theory. This would be a, an operator that would come in at M5 or low. So you see, if you would yeah. do that, it would fix it. Uh, yeah. But this, this is, yeah. this is cheating. Yeah, yeah, this is cheating. <laughs> uh, uh, this, is, this is where, if you want to stay within um, effective field theory in its standard form, you would say, this is how it behaves at a lattice spacing of 1.97 Fermi. You would say, you do OK up to auction 16. You get on the order of 8%, 9% error over binding, but then you systematically get more. Now, if you, if, if you want to stay strict, then you just basically the story is you calculate what A less than or equal to 16. That's, that's, the, that's the moral. If you, if you, this, is, this is something proportional to the number of alpha clusters. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. So how big it would be for calcium 40? So calcium 40, this is why I say I don't think we can do calcium 40. No, but you can estimate this equal. Yeah. This, this yeah, this would be, this one would need to work much harder for calcium 40. No, no, you see, calculation is one thing, but estimate this, the, the contribution of this whole Yeah, it would it'd be non perturbative at that, very non perturbative at that, at that stage. So we would not do the calculation this way at calcium 40. Okay. Have yeah. you done this at a coarser lattice? Uh, whether you've yeah. got a systematic error from the lattice basically? 
It, it's definitely a systematic error from the lattice spacing. It's actually coming from the lattice spacing, definitely. So if we take a smaller lattice spacing and we have more of the hardcore repulsion, this just should simply just go away. The oxygen 16 should, should be on, on, on the nose. Uh, it, no, it, it, it is affordable. It's just that this is the first time we've looked at anything beyond A equals 16. So this is our first stab at it. We, we just did this a couple months ago. Yeah. So the three body forces are attractive yeah. or repulsive? The three body forces are overall attractive in the alpha nuclei. Yeah. I believe that's what you also see, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. OK. All right, carrying on. Yeah. OK, carrying on. Um, so we also then looked at the structure of oxygen 16. Since I'm running out of time, here's I won't I'll tell you about this, these plots. You know what these are, different initial states. And so what we see is that for the ground state, we get a tetrahedral structure of alpha clusters for the first zero class as well as the first three minus. And then we also see there are other, there's, another uh, there's a second zero plus state, which actually seems orthogonal to the first one. It does not mix, because we look at the two by two matrix. And this seems to be a square configuration of alpha clusters. Now, obviously, the fact that it's a square is, 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 is probably the biggest around the lattice, but it seems to be some sort of a planar type configuration, perhaps more rhomboidal or something in the continuum. OK, so we can, I can show you the low-lying spectrum of oxygen 16 we get. So this in, if we include this smeared 4N interaction, we actually end up with a reasonable um, um, representation of the low-energy spectrum. So at least we're getting some of the physics of oxygen 16 right. So how do you get the spectrum? Uh, how, what's, it, what's the general approach to getting anything other than the ground state? Yeah, so, so basically, uh, for, if, if you have the same quantum numbers, what you need to do is construct an, a matrix of amplitudes. You have one initial state with a zero plus and another initial state with a zero plus. Okay? And then you have those guys, those two initial states as also final states. And you get a two by two matrix of amplitudes. And you just simply calculate the eigenvalues. If you reject long enough, you have the same quantum numbers. Everything should reject them. Because yeah, but, but if you orthogonalize, if you, if you say you get one eigenvalue that's the lowest, and then you orthogonalize with respect to it, you will get the second one. Yeah. And remember, we're not going so far that, that we lose the signal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK? All right, so in the, in the zero time I have remaining, um, uh, we did some uh, simulations of, of neutron matter, uh, d dilute neutron matter. So this would be relevant to the inner crust of a neutron star, somewhere between less than a percent of nuclear matter density to on the order of maybe one third of nuclear matter, uh, about a f a one half of, of, of the, the matter uh, saturation or the uh, density of, of, of nucleons in the iron nucleus. And so I'm just going to show you some preliminary results as a function of density, uh, particles per cubic femtome uh, femtometer, and the energy of the system divided by the energy of the free system in the same sort of confining s box. <coughs> this is data taking up, taken up to 28 nu neutrons. So this is just preliminary results that Gautam has, has produced. And this is uh, triangles are next, uh, sorry, the squares are leading order, um, circles are next to leading order, and next to next leading order are the triangles. You can see this in a more sort of um, transparent plot. Um, you have the same density here. And now here is the energy per particle. And so our results at next to leading order are these triangles here. And for comparison, you can see some of the calculations done by Akim and Kai. Um, and you can see some. Um, in, in a second, you also see some of the, uh, here, you can see it compared with, with the auxiliary field diffusion Monte Carlo calculations um, that some of the guys here did. Um, so you can see it's, it's in reasonable agreement. It's, it's a little bit on top of, of their data. We are going to then also do simulations with the smaller lattice spacing. That should give us this coverage, and it will also check our systematic errors in this region, and so we'll see what happens with that. Now, because I'm running out of time, I'll just shift to my last topic. So what we're also developing, this might be interesting to those of you who are doing um, Monte Carlo simulations, is how to do scattering and reactions on the lattice. So we've developed this technique called the projected adiabatic matrix method, or just projection, adiabatic projection method. Um, and this developed from our observation that when we did simulations of these alpha clusters and nuclei, that th there are two timescales here. One timescale for the alpha clusters to form, and then a longer timescale for these alpha clusters to rearrange. So there's, there's two separate timescales. So this gave us the idea that we could use this uh, idea of two separate timescales to do some sort of Born-Oppenheimer type of approach for doing scattering of nuclei. 
All right. So the idea is we start off with a whole bunch of different initial states that are continuum states of clusters. So for example, here's alpha alpha for doing al alpha alpha scattering. And we have a separation between these two alpha clusters by a vector r. So we take this initial state, these cluster states, and then we just time project using projection Monte Carlo onto, onto the state. And then we get a dress state, which is r sub t. So the idea is this is some sort of a continuum state, some sort of a wave packet with a separation of about r. Right? Now we're going to construct a norm matrix and a matrix of expectation values. Now these states are not orthogonal, so we need to construct a norm matrix here, just the overlap of r, the dressed r prime and the dressed r here. And then we calculate the expectation value of any operator, including the Hamiltonian. So I'll call this O sub t. And then now we just simply multiply on the left by the square root, the inverse square root of n, and on the right by the inverse square root of n. And then we have in the basis of these states uh, a representation of, of this, of this uh, operator. So essentially what we've done is we've reduced the space to, uh, to an adiabatic calculation. Um, in a reduced space of these clusters. We've de de reduced the degrees of freedom. So this is similar to um, what Peter and Sof uh, 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 what Sophia have done with the no core shell model with this, what's called the resonating group method. Um, there are some differences, though. Uh, one important difference is that we actually get the distortion of the nuclear wave functions automatically as these guys um, come close uh, as a function of time. So I can show you how this converges. This is actually an exact method. Even though it's an uh, adiabatic approximation, you, you might think it's an approximation. But as you project long enough, it, everything becomes exact. So if you project, for example, a whole bunch of states, the error that you get in this calculation is given by e to the minus delta e, where delta e, sorry, e to the minus delta t, delta e times t, where delta e is the gap in energy between the state you care about and the first state you, you don't include in your spectrum. So it actually converges quite quickly that way. So we've done tests for, uh, of this method for doing the scattering uh, in the quartet, so spin quartet channel um, near the neutron and deuteron. In pilus effective field theory and C, we do it for different lattice spacings, and we recover the, 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 the phase shift, the elastic phase shift, quite well up to the, the breakup threshold. Um, and we have also now are developing how to do things like capture reactions. So these are very important in the star for being able to capture um, a proton. Now, in order to capture a proton, you need to also release uh, a photon. And so we've done things like NP to D gamma. This is something I did with Gautam Rupak. It's in PRL and Press. Um, so we, we've done uh, things in pilus effective field theory. I'm not going to go into the details because I'm out of time. But basically, we're able on the lattice by using various infrared regulators. Basically, uh, we're, we're cutting off the, the, the long range physics and then taking the cutoff to zero to get to the infinite volume limit. And we can compare with the exact uh, continuum expressions for the M1 transition for NP to D gamma. And you can compare the exact values with the lattice calculations. So, so the point is, is that we have a technology of dividing the, uh, 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 an inelastic <coughs> reaction on the nucleus into two separate parts. The first part is to do a Monte Carlo calculation, wh which we all do in love. We do a Monte Carlo calculation to set up an adiabatic matrix, sort of an effective matrix. And then what we do with that effective matrix, with all these expectation values of operators, we then can do, go into Minkowski space, so essentially real-time evolution, and calculate reaction amplitudes that way. OK, that's, that's the idea. All right, so sorry for going over, but to summarize, this is actually kind of an exciting time for nuclear theory from first principles. There are big science discoveries being made now, but many more around the corner. And although lattice effective field theory is a pretty new and uh, tool, it seems kind of promising. Hopefully it plays some role in the future in ab initio nuclear theory. So the, some of the things we're working on now is taking these different lattice spacings, that's quite important, and taking n not equal to z as well as odd nuclei, odd number of particles. Um, and looking at nucleus-nucleus scattering reactions, we're doing calculations now. We're starting to go up to N3LO, and we're looking at clustering in these, al these, these heavier nuclei. And one of the things we're going to work on quite hard over the next couple of years is to see if we can see a transition from S wave to P wave pairing in superfluid neutron matter. Now, what's nice about this, we actually can tune an interaction that makes the P wave pairing stronger than physical. And so we're thinking that we can actually see the P wave pairing and then tune it back down to the physical value and see if there's any remnant remaining in that limit. <laughs> so thank you very much for your time. Yeah, yeah, okay. when, you, when you do this, these latter calculations where you're uh -huh. uh, working with the non-orthogonality and the 
various matrices, then the usual statistical errors are a lot trickier. So what do you do about yeah. So, 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 yeah. So, so stochastic. You're talking about the, the stochastic errors in the matrix amplitudes. Yeah. yeah. So those are actually very well under control for the low state. So if we're doing low energy scattering or low energy processes, these are not affected at all. The, the point is, we don't work with a whole bunch of initial states that are very similar to each other. We work with states that are spatially separated from each other. So there's no sort of very very difficult orthogonalization that needs to be done. Is this because you mostly do this alpha cluster? The alpha uh, clusters help you. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's stronger. It's <laughs> stronger for the alpha clusters, absolutely. So, but if I would have done any other look, yeah. like, so, what happens? So, so as, as, it, yeah, as I mentioned to Francisco, so if you are only uh, one or two nucleons away from the alpha cluster, it's, it's not bad at all. You, you, you lose a factor of maybe, you get a maybe 60% reduction, no, sorry, 50% reduction in, in, in the sign or something like that. It's not a catastrophic effect. And you only converge, I mean, you see convergence yeah. to the dark. Yeah. So neutron rich would be. Neutron rich is hard. So okay. some, yeah, <laughs> very, very neutron rich. That, we're not going to touch that. Um, but, but there might be some other way of, doing, of, of dealing with the action there. Now, um, yeah, actually, I, yeah. That's all I wanted to say about that. And do you see convergence in this next building order next to next? I mean, yeah, well, we yeah, you, you, what I mean, you, you saw like one to number that yeah, yeah, what you want to do is go to N3 LO. And so, so we have actually a lot of manpower imported <coughs> actually coming from China. <laughs> it's kind of funny. <laughs> so, so Ulf has uh, um, some postdocs and students who are, who are uh, devoted to doing the N3 LO calculations. So, so we'll be working on that over the next year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, what will allow us to go to the smaller lab spacing is we have more computer time too, as well. So we have time for that. No, no, that that's <laughs> Ger that's Germany. <laughs> that's Germany. <laughs> yeah. So this is a very basic question for the, the chemists here. What yeah. is the basic effect that causes alpha cluster? Is okay, the, the basic. The physics. Fit. Okay, the point is the underlying interactions at low energies in nuclear physics are attractive. Okay, and that's very important, and that's why the auxiliary field is, is, is doing well. Okay, now th the point is that there are four degrees of freedom, four components of fermions. So the Pauli exclusion principle prevents you from having more than four at a single site. So it maximizes itself by having four, and that's your alpha cluster. With, with neutrons, you can only have two. With neutrons, you can have two. Yeah, that's right. Thank you, Dean, again.